right, guys, this is um, our finish up of the lecture on reproduction for canine and feline reproduction. Um, we're going to talk about types of artificial insemination, and then we're going to talk about feline reproduction, and then that will finish up our lecture. So um, what is artificial insemination? So artificial is basically inseminating the female without the male's penis actually making contact with the vagina. That's artificial insemination. It can be done in any species. Um, we are really good at um, creating um, ways to make this happen. Um, and just in the years that I've been involved with artificial insemination in canines, um, the advances we have made in probably the last um, 10 years has been crazy what we can do. It's pretty awesome. Um, but basically all we're doing is we're inserting um, the semen directly into the female is all that's happening. Um, so we've figured out there if, if whether it's in, um, inserted into just the vagina, into the cervix, or actually directly into the uterus, those are all types of artificial insemination. Um, now when you uh, have a fertilized egg and you put the fertilized egg in the female, that's a little different. It's not considered artificial insemination. That's um, more along the lines of in vitro fertilization. So um, we, you can do that in dogs. It's just not very common. Um, that's pretty technical. So um, we see it actually really a lot in cattle. Um, cattle, has, cattle is way ahead of um, dogs. So it's pretty cool that um, you see something like a farm animal being more advanced than canine. You'd think it might be the opposite sometimes. But um, artificial insemination is probably the more common method of dogs in now, I would say. Um, obviously, live cover still happens. Um, nature is nature. And when you get two dogs, a male and a female dog together, and the female's in heat, um, it's going to happen. But um, when it comes to planned pregnancies in dogs, I would say that artificial inseminations are a more common method because instead of doing live cover, we're shipping semen. So you might pick your stud dog, stud dog out of California. So rather than driving to California with your female or vice versa, um, that semen can be shipped here to Ohio, um, cooled or even frozen. Um, and they even have methods now, like I me mean, with frozen, just like, in, like they come in little straws. Um, they can free semen of dead animals, so that way um, you can continue on a line of animals that maybe the male has passed away 10 years ago, so that's pretty cool. Um, artificial insemination is definitely the most common method of conception in cattle and horses and other farm animals, um, but for sure cattle, um, I would say that there's more cattle that are artificially insemination that are artificially inseminated than live cover, and in horses, almost every breed of horse is done through artificial insemination except um, thoroughbreds because it is illegal. Um, you can't register your thoroughbred um, if they're artificially inseminated. It's live cover only and they've done that to keep their lines very close and very, um, they only, they, I, I, they, they, they want to make it very prestigious and that's basically because of the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown and things like that. So um, reasons we might choose artificial insemination. Um, the bitch might not accept the male, so maybe she just doesn't like him or she doesn't like other dogs in general. So that's obviously a, one reason we might choose artificial insemination. Um, if you're shipping the semen from, like I said, from California, from Canada, from Europe, we get a lot of shipments from Europe. Um, so shipping semen from there, um, if the male has low fertility or even if the female has low fertility, uh, if she's got something going on, you have a better chance of are uh, getting her pregnant and the litter size with maybe a certain type of artificial insemination like um, doing something along the lines of surgical AI. Um, and then we can minimize the number of breedings. So instead of having to breed three different times or two times like we talked about with live cover, we can do it just once or maybe just twice. Um, it's very easy to pinpoint our date of um, conception and very easy to pinpoint then obviously what day she is going to um, start into parturition. Um, however, artificial insemination requires timing of ovulation. You have to run progesterone tests, otherwise you're, you might um, be wasting money. And the reason is because we don't have to wait for that semen to travel all the way up the tract because of some of these methods, we're actually depositing the semen right directly into the uterus and the semen's, the semen's already there and so its trip is much shorter to get to the egg. So there's uh, multiple types, but we're going to talk about three types. And the first we're going to talk about is regular AI. Then we're going to talk about transcervical AI. And then we're going to talk about surgical AI. So um, bitches ovulate around day 10 after they enter proestrus. So that's when you're going to see um, that discharge starting. So proestrus, remember, is that first stage. You're going to see that bloody discharge. 
Um, or about one to two days of estrus. So if you remember, estrus is actually when she's receptive to the male. So she's starting to be receptive to the male before she actually ovulates. So before she releases that egg, she's already saying, hey. So um, we know that she's going to already be willing to accept the male. And that's because normally in live cover, it takes, and like if you remember, I said the, the semen can live for up to 72 hours in the reproductive tract. It takes sometimes um, 12 to 24 hours for that semen to even get where it needs to be going. Um, so that, that is one of the reasons that she's um, already interested in the male before she actually ovulates. Um, ovulation can be detected in multiple ways. Um, an LH assay, so if you guys remember, LH is luteinizing hormone, and that's the hormone that spikes and causes ovulation. So FSH is first, that's that first wave, that follicle stimulating hormone that's causing the follicles to glow, to grow. Luteinizing hormone comes and it goes boom and those follicles burst and release the egg. So we can look for that LH peak. Um, progesterone assay, um, and that's our most common because if you remember, progesterone levels rise um, at the time of ovulation because progesterone is pro-pregnancy. Progesterone, pro-pregnancy. Progesterone is necessary to maintain pregnancy. So that's gonna be our most common way to detect ovulation. And then you can also do um, cytology of the vaginal, feet, uh, vaginal smear, which we talked about, um, and that we're gonna be looking for those cornified cells. However, our most common is going to be our progesterone. Um, so oocytes in the canine are ovulated as um, first degree oocytes. So oocytes are the egg or the little egg that's released, and they must mature, into, and mature in the oviduct. So if you remember, I said the fallopian tubes, we call them oviducts in animals. So in those o oviducts, that is actually where fertilization happens and they have to actually grow a little bit before they can become fertilized. So we have to let the female ovulate and then those eggs need to drop down. So we're not going to, um, we don't wanna do an artificial insemination before or on the day of ovulation because we need those oocytes to mature so that fertilization can happen. Um, with fresh or cooled semen, um, insemination two days off after ovulation detected and again, 48 to 72 hours later, so we usually do two there. Um, with frozen semen, we wanna do insemination on day five or seven after ovulation, and that's because um, the from is frozen semen does not last as long, and it's usually not as good as fresh or cooled. Um, you're gonna have some damage to the semen when it's frozen, that's just something that happens naturally. Um, so we want, to, it, we want that oocyte to be very close to maturity, and with frozen semen, um, you're going to do surgical AI. You're not going to do trans, trans cervical, and you're not going to do regular. With frozen semen, you're almost always going to do surgical AI. And that's because we put it in at the tip of the uterus, right up by the fallopian tube, so they don't have to travel very far. They're already right where they need to be going. It'd be like dropping you off at the entrance of the building, and you need to come right here where I'm standing. Um, so rather than dropping you off in Hayesville and having you get here, we are going to drop you off at the door, and you're just going to walk in. So um, with artificial insemination, no matter what type we choose to do, we have to collect the male. And so we have these things called collection kits, um, and you can purchase them or you can get the things separately that you need and um, then use what you need. Um, but you have to have a sterile latex cone that's collect, um, attached to a sterile plastic test tube. So there's your latex cone and there's your test tube. They do make um, plastic versions but they don't feel as good to the male, so he might not collect as well. This feels closer to what a normal vagina would feel like. So it'd be like, um, just like when they collect horses, they use, um, they actually use warmed cones that are inside of these uh, artificial vaginas, and they fill them up with water, and they're nice and warm, and so it feels, feels more natural to the animal. So that's what we, we wanna make it a more natural process to them. So, um, and then you need non-spermicidal lube. So um, they make non-spermicidal lube, but you can actually use KY jelly. KY jelly that you can purchase at Walmart is non-spermicidal lube. Um, but you don't wanna use something that is spermicidal. Some OB lubes that like are just in the big gallon containers are actually um, spermicidal. And you don't wanna use those because obviously you're gonna kill the sperm when you do the insemination. Um, gloves, because you don't wanna touch any of that with your bare hand, ew. Um, Sterile syringes um, so that you can um, insert the semen and we want uh, plastic um, at the tip and not rubber because we've, as more research has been done, we have found that rubber is actually um, spermicidal so we don't wanna use rubber tips so they're plastic tips. Um, 
a sterile canine AI rod, or depending on what type of artificial insemination you're doing, um, you might need something different there, but we're, for this case, we're just gonna talk about regular. So a sterile canine AI rod, and then sometimes you might need an in-heat female or estrus pheromone, so if the male's never been collected before, he might actually need to mount that female to go through the motions, um, where some males, uh, they've been collected before, so like if you guys actually got to see me collect Duggan, he's been collected before, he doesn't need a, he doesn't need a female. He knows when I carry this stuff, he knows what it is. Because we've collected dug into um, breed females before, um, and we do um, just regular AI. So he, when he sees this, he knows what his job is. He's basically already air humping before he even um, knows what's happening because he's ready to go. He's had it done before. So, um, and trust me, the male dogs don't mind this. They don't mind this whole process. Most of the time, they um, they see you and they get excited about it. They know what's happening. Um, so this is actually pictures from my vet clinic. Um, this is Dr. Teresa Hawksworth. She, um, if, you can, if you guys could see this, it says 2010. So this has been a while since I took these pictures. Um, but this is what I, this is from the vet clinic I worked at, and these are two dogs, and we will talk about them later. But with artificial insemination, we have to arouse the male and collect him. In this case, the female's in the cage, so um, he needed to smell her to get aroused. But then um, you can see here, um, his penis is engorged and they're collecting him into a latex cone, and there's uh, on top bottom of that latex cone, there is a um, sterile plastic tube connected. Um, so she, and she's got gloves on, so she's collecting him. We look at the semen under the microscope. We wanna make sure that it's good, has good quality, a good um, quantity of semen before we use it, because if the semen's all dead, there's no point in even um, inseminating the female. We need to pick a different male. Um, so as long as the semen is good, it can be centrifuged at a very low speed if we want. This, this part is optional, very low. If you centrifuge it at a high speed, you're gonna smash all the sperm and you're gonna kill them. So at a very low speed, and what that does is it puts a pellet of semen at the bottom and all the rest of the um, ejaculate at the top. So when you suck it out, you're gonna go put, when you suck it out of the tube, you're gonna put that, um, uh, that rod all the way at the bottom and suck that pellet out first. So the semen rich portion, um, or you can, I mean, suck it out last, so that semen-rich portion, portion is at the tip of the syringe and goes into the female first, and all the, all the post-ejaculate and everything else goes up to help push it up in. Um, so the semen is sucked up from the test tube into the syringe using the AI rod. So we either use an AI rod or we use, um, you can also use these little, um, these little tubes like this. Um, and you are going to insert either the AI rod or one of these um, special tubes. And this kind of, it's got a little balloon on it. And um, you can, that balloon is blown up right here with air and it actually simulates the tie. So it kind of simulates that bulbous gland and it keeps the semen also from coming back out the vagina and pushes it further up in towards the cervix. Um, and we wanna get that um, AI rod in the vagina and up towards the cervix. Now we're not gonna enter the cervix with this method. We just wanna get it up and as close to the cervix as we can. And then the semen is actually deposited in the uh, vagina, not the uterus, so in the vagina. And then um, the female should be kept at um, an upward angle. So you can kind of see here her butt's pointing up. So we either need to back them up onto something or actually hold them up. And then that's just to help the um, semen go in. We're gonna use gravity to our advantage. I mean, why not, right? So, um, this just shows here, here's your collection tubes. Um, this is your uh, non-spermicidal jelly. So there should be two latex cones because some males give us so much of a collection, we actually need two of these. Um, and then this here just shows the, um, one of those special tubes being put into the, the in, they're actually, it's actually called a Foley catheter. Um, so it's just a, a Foley catheter, just has that balloon on it. So that Foley catheter is put into the vagina and up in towards the cervix. So this kind of shows you here. This is an AI rod. Um, the cervix is right here. So we're not actually gonna get through that. We're just gonna deposit the semen right there at the entrance. And then it's gonna go up into the uterus itself. And then this is just a, um, a rubber or um, like a padded mat that they're backing that female up onto to get her butt up in the air so we can have that proper angle that we want. Um, so the next one we're going to talk about is transcervical artificial insemination. So we're, we're, so we're going to try to call this TCI. Um, and this is an actual technique which a rigid, rigid endoscope is used to locate the cervix and they pass a catheter through the cervix for intrauterine insemination. And we use this, um, we can use frozen semen, cooled semen, um, 
or any, actually you can just use fresh semen too, um, but it eliminates the need for surgery. So if you guys remember an endoscope is basically like we can use those um, in the nose, we can use them in the throat, and when they're passed down and it has a little camera we can see, so this is actually what it looks like. So they have a little camera on a screen and they put this endoscope in and then they find the entrance of the cervix. And then they pass this tiny little itty bitty catheter in and they're actually able to push it up into the cervix and through the cervix into the uterus and then this little um, catheter has a tip on it and then you just take the semen, you're able to push it through that catheter and it's deposited directly into the um, uterus, which is exactly where the semen needs to go because it's gonna go from the uterus up into those fallopian tubes, which is where fertilization happens. So this is exactly um, what we're looking, where the semen needs to go. And so the advent advantage of this is that we're putting the semen closer to where the egg is, so um, that's even better, This, which is exactly what we want. Um, so just like I just explained, um, an endoscope, which is a tiny video camera, is passed into the vaginal canal of the bitch and then up into the cervix. Your inseminator is able to watch the position of the catheter on a monitor, and then you can see what you're doing. And it's actually pretty cool when you get to watch the videos of it. Um, so insemination can actually be visualized because um, you're, um, which, as you're pushing that little, when you see the cervix, and when you push that little catheter through into the cervix, if there's any, sometimes you might see a little back flush of the, um, Semen come out of the cervix, um, but it minimizes that, and so most of our semen is deposited in the uterus, which is exactly where it needs to go. Um, and it's a vital part of frozen semen technology, or if you have semen that is maybe got low, low fertility because of either quantity or quality, um, we have more likely, um, more in likely chance of getting the female pregnant. Um, it's equally important for um, timing, obviously, um, and then also uh, we've, we've noticed that um, conception rates of 83.3% and an average loader size of seven and a half were possible um, in bitches of, of an unknown breeding history. So 83% conception rate is fantastic, fantastic. And a litter size of seven and a half, that's amazing. If you're breeding um, French Bulldogs, which is our very expensive uh, breed, um, and you can sell those puppies for let's just say $4,000 a piece. Do you want seven puppies or do you want five puppies? I mean, if for me, I want seven puppies. That's an extra $8,000. That's crazy. And trans cervical AI is not that expensive. You're probably going to spend around um, maybe five to 600 bucks to get, to get your breeding in. Um, it could be upward of $1,000 if you have um, multiple progesterone tests. But um, I'm going to spend $1,000 to make four. Does that make sense? So um, I would rather spend a little bit of money, have a larger litter size, have a better conception rate than um, trying to do it the cheap way and maybe only get three puppies. Um, so I have a video for you guys to watch of trans cervical AI. It's really cool. Um, so take a look at that video um, and you'll get to see the whole process. So for surgical artificial insemination, so this is the next step. So regular AI are cheapest. Trans cervical AI are next most expensive. Surgical AI is our most expensive, but also one of our best methods. Um, we do a progesterone test and we confirm ovulation. Obviously with any of these methods, methods, we're going to be running a progesterone test before we put this kind of money in because we want to make sure our AI timing is perfect. I don't wanna spend, um, especially here, I'm gonna be spending over $1,000. I don't wanna spend six or 800 bucks or something that's not gonna work. I want my ovulation to be right, especially if I'm shipping semen, I don't have access to the mail. Um, I want to make sure, I'm only gonna get two doses of that semen and I want to, those two doses to work. So I'm going to do a progesterone test anytime we do any type of um, artificial insemination. So progesterone test is gonna confirm ovulation. We're gonna make sure it's happened. Um, we're gonna know where in her cycle she is because we've probably been doing progesterone tests. And then um, we're gonna go ahead and do our surgical AI. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna place an IV catheter in the female because she's gonna go under, uh, undergo anesthesia. We put that catheter, um, we do an IV catheter so we have access to a vein in case of an emergency situation. We also use propofol which gets directed, injected directly into the vein um, and propofol is a very safe anesthesia. These females that are getting surgical AI are not cheap females. It's not just your backyard dog. These females are worth thousands of dollars. They're breeding females, they have good genetics, they're good moms. They, these people care about these dogs. They do not want them anything to happen to them. So we're very careful when we do surgical AI. Um, we collect the male in the same manner as we would um, a regular AI. So but we have the female ready to go. So as soon as that collection's collected, we place that um, semen on the microscope, she's ready to go. Um, so 
We're going to tell you a little love story. This is um, Harley and this is Lola. And actually, since this, um, I did this PowerPoint, um, Harley is no longer with us. So that's literally really sad. But this was in 2010. It is 2020. So that was 10 years ago. And he was probably five or six there. So he lived a good long life. Um, but Harley was a very, very good boy. Harley knew his job when he came into the vet clinic. Actually, as soon as he saw, there was only two people that ever collected him, me and, uh, me and Jen and then Dr. Hawksworth sometimes would help. Um, but Harley saw us, he knew. Uh, Harley would, um, his penis would get engorged, he'd be ready to go. Like if you weren't ready when he was ready, you were gonna miss it because he was going to just start ejaculating on the floor because he knew exactly what his job was. Um, and this is his girlfriend, um, Lola. And, and so um, first thing we had to do was collect the, collect the mail. So this shows you here, um, this is the collection process. There's your latex cone. You can kind of see um, down here, the clear, um, kind of clear ejaculate in here. That's um, all pre-ejaculate. That's not the semen rich portion. But you guys can see, here's the bulbous gland. So the bulbous gland is up behind her hand. And when you collect the mail, you have to get that bulbous gland out of the sheath of the penis. Because what we see on the outside, that's the sheath. It needs to come all the way out of that. And we need to get that sheath up behind the bulbous gland. Because if that bulbous gland actually engorges inside the sheath, it's very uncomfortable for the male and they don't like it. It's like restricting it, it doesn't, and it hurts. So we want to get, we have to push that sheath back, get that penis all the way out, um, allow him to hump and go through the motions. And then I'm going to actually, um, kind of firmly but gently clamp down with my hand behind the bulbous gland um, to kind of simulate a tie for him and that's gonna help his body go through the motions that it should. So you guys can see this is the bulb, the bulb right here, you can see how swollen it is. Um, and he's, they've got the latex cone over that. Um, and then we actually pull it backwards because what is that simulating? When I pull the penis backwards, it's the same thing as when the male and the female are tied together, when the male turns around and faces the opposite, opposite direction and his penis is stuck inside her. So we wanna actually um, simulate that. So we want to make this as real as possible for the male because his body will produce a better uh, collection if we do. Um, so if you guys can see here, there's um, ejaculate coming into the collection tube um, and it's pretty clear right now because that's all pre-ejaculate. We want it to become more milky white and that is our sperm rich portion. Um, so you guys can see here, this is a little, um, this is a little darker. So this has got a little more cloudy. Cloudy is good. We want that sperm rich portion. So now this, and when we collect Hardy, Harley, we actually use three of these. And so we try to collect the pre-ejaculate in one and put that off to the side. Then we collect the sperm rich portion in another. And then when it starts to turn clear again, we pull that off and we collect this, the, end, the end or the post ejaculate with another. We still spin, the, spin them all down. But if you guys look at this picture here, your sperm rich portion um, and with some accessory fluid is, is darker than your accessory fluid, um, which is just doesn't have any sperm in it. And the only part that we care about inseminating the female with is the um, sperm rich portion because ejaculation volumes can vary. They can be two mLs, they can be 30 mLs. If I'm injecting the semen directly where it needs to go, I can't put 30 mLs of, of, of this ejaculation into the uterus. I'm actually only gonna wanna put maybe five, 10 at the very, very most, 10 is a ton. 10 at the very, very most. So which is one of the reasons that we can spin it down and we try to get that um, sperm rich portion. That's the only portion we use for surgical AI. Um, so we can have a lot of food, just like I just explained, we have a lot of food that doesn't actually con contain sperm. And then some dogs become bloody at the end of the collection, which Harley was one of those dogs, which is the reason we pulled that sperm rich portions off and we collected um, the accessory fluid at the end in a different one. Um, because that blood, if you remember from the last lecture, is spermicidal, and so we don't want to add that into our surgical AI. So once we've done that, um, both tubes of ejaculated are uh, evaluated for their viability, which just means we want to see how good the sperm is. Is it alive? Is it looking okay? Um, and so we just place a drop on it on a slide with a cover slip and we look at it under the microscope, make sure everything looks okay. It's super brief. The entire time we're doing this, we're keeping that um, ejaculate we collected warm. Um, I will tell you that I'm the person, I stick them inside my shirt next to my chest because it's nice and warm. Um, they also, sometimes we put it in the incubator um, so we can just stick the tubes in the tube holder in the incubator to keep it warm until we're ready for it. If the semen's considered viable, then the female's anesthetized with propofol, which I said earlier is a, um, 
very safe anesthesia. It's actually what Michael Jackson was using to sleep, if you guys remember that. Um, so that's propofol. Very, very safe. It's short acting. It only lasts about 15 minutes. So we um, and that's time with propofol, and we actually hooked them up to isofluorine or gas, which is the same anesthesia machine we have in our surgery suite. Um, so this here is propofol on a syringe. So that's propofol there, and then that's just some um, saline flush to flush it into the catheter. Um, there's looking at the semen on the microscope. Then um, the female's prepped like a spay for surgery. So as you can see, they're just going to shave this area down here, just like we would for um, just like we would for uh, a spay. Now she's got a scar there because this is not her first time. So these, these, this female is surgically eyed every time, and then she's had a, she has a timed C-section every time because bulldogs, because of the way that we have genetically bred them, their shoulders are really wide and they have small heads, and so and then their pelvises are very small they don't fit out that hole. They can have them on their own, but I would say 90% of the time they can't have the whole litter on their own. So we do a, a time to C-section. Um, so here's supplies needed. We got gloves, suture, um, syringes, and as you guys can see, these have rubber on them. We no longer use these type of syringes, but this was in 2010, and like I said, we've done studies now to see that rubber can be somewhat spermicidal, so we actually switched to plastic syringes um, that have plastic um, stoppers in them. And then a spay pack because we need a sterile pack because we actually are going to um, in, do an incision into the abdominal cavity. So we prepped her, we cleaned her. You guys can see here she's on her IV. Um, she's on gas anesthesia here because the propofol, like I said, wears off after about 15 minutes. Um, so Lola's prepped for surgery. She's ready to go. So there she is on the table, um, and the semen's kept warm. And right now I'm holding it tightly in my hand or replacing the incubator. Like I said, you can stick it in your shirt, but just don't bend over because you'll dump it. That's, you don't want to do that. Um, you'll have to start the whole process over. So um, the incision's made into the abdomen, similar to a spay, but smaller. It's probably only maybe an inch, inch and a half if we're having a really hard time. But I would say about an inch is all we need. And then we actually... Um, expose the uterus so we pull the uterus out so you guys can see here this is the cervix back here and then here is one side of the uterus that's horn one and horn two um, because with the anatomy of the uterus you have your vagina and then you have your cervix in between the vagina and the uterus and then you have the body of the uterus and then both horns so they make like a y so the body of the uterus is right here and then there's each horn of the uterus um, so we've ex exposed both those horns we don't pull the ovaries out this stuff you see here, that's um, just omentum, which is just connective tissue. It holds everything in place. Um, and then we pour the um, semen into a sterile syringe, and the, uh, the doctor um, takes that and then pulls the stopper off and then pours the semen into the syringe, and she puts the stopper back in, and then you attach a 22 gauge by one and a half inch needle. So a 22 gauge is a very small needle, so, um, and then one and a half is just a long needle. Um, and then so 22 gauge is how big it is, and then one and a half inch is how long it is. And then any air in this syringe is slowly directed out. We look at the semen and we say, okay, there are three mLs of semen in here, because that's something we note in the chart. Um, and then it's um, injected into each horn of the uterus up towards the ovaries. Because if um, you look at the, the uterus, each horn goes up in Ys, and there's an ovary at either end of that horn. So we're gonna inject it up into the, the uterine horns towards the ovaries so that where that's because that, because why? Arti um, with, artif with insemination, the inse with, <laughs> with fertilization, excuse me, with fertilization, fertilization takes place in the fallopian tubes or the oviducts, which are up at the end of the uterus towards the ovaries. Um, so you can see here, she's poking that uh, needle in um, and then she's gonna deposit half in one side and half in the other side, and voila, we hope that she's pregnant. Let me get rid of this. Okay, okay so once the seeping of blood is stopped, the uterus is pushed back um, into the uterus because we have to, oh, I missed one, sorry. Um, so light pressure is placed over each injection site um, to stop any bleeding, um, and then we wipe the blood away because remember, blood is spermicidal, so we don't we want as little or no blood as possible. But anytime you poke something, there's going to be a little blood. So we just place some light pressure. Um, the pretty cool thing is when you push this semen into the uterus, you can actually see the uterus expand with the semen that you're pushing in there. So again, which is one of the reasons we want to use a very small amount, because if we use a large amount, 
that poor little tiny uterus can't handle all that. And now it's meant to expand because obviously it expands with all the puppies, but that expansion takes place slowly, not immediate. So then we um, put pressure um, and then wipe away the blood, shove the uterus back into, no, well not shove, gently place the uterus back in the abdomen, and we close the incision. As you guys can see, it's a very tiny incision. Um, the females were covered and kept overnight um, because we want to obviously make sure she's okay from surgery. And then again, the next day, we perform a regular AI approximately 12 to 18 hours after our surgical AI. Um, and that's just basically our, um, I call it our insurance plan. In case something happened with the semen during um, surgical AI, we want to do a regular AI just in case. It just helps um, improve, number one, our conception rates, and number two, it, it also, in case we were too early or whatever on our timing, the regular AI will, um, if the egg wasn't quite mature yet, the regular AI then will help make sure that we do get um, at least some puppies out of it to help cover surgery costs. So why do we like surgical AI? Um, we see a very large litter size with it because the semen's right where it needs to be. And if you remember with dogs, dogs don't ovulate just one egg. They have litters, just like cats have litters and, and um, humans don't have litters. So we normally ovulate one egg at a time, uh, just like horses and cows, usually one egg at a time. Now there's a possibility to ovulate two and have twins um, or for that egg to divide. But in dogs and cats, they're releasing multiple eggs. When, they, when their follicles burst, we have multiple follicles bur bursting, multiple eggs being released and multiple fertilizations happening. So we want to, uh, the idea is to um, get as many of those eggs fertilized as possible so that way we can have an increased litter size. Um, we also do this if we have a breed that's unable, unable to have natural cover. We have all these designer breeds now. We have um, tiny little poodles that we are, um, we are, that we are inseminating with maybe uh, our Bernese Mountain Dogs. So we have a dog that's eight pounds and we're inseminating it with a 180 pound, 180 pound dog. So that's not gonna work. We need to make sure that, um, I mean, it, that, that's, he's, he's this big and she's this big. So we, with something like that, they're not gonna have natural cover. That's gonna be artificial. Um, the male might have poor quality semen. Maybe he doesn't have a very high sperm count. So maybe um, his sperm count's really low. This is gonna help increase litter size for him. Or sometimes you can have females that can have malformations. So maybe their vagina's really small or she's got a hooded, hooded vagina, which is where like the, you can't maybe get the penis up in well. Or even we had a French bulldog that only had one uterine horn and one ovary. But she had litters because we did surgical artificial insemination. Only one horn, but she was able to have litter. She had really good genetics, so they wanted to breed her. Um, not something I would recommend, but the owners wanted to do it. They, she was really expensive. She came from Holland or someplace in Europe, and she cost a lot of money. So um, why not to do it? It is expensive. Um, I mean, you're looking at probably $1,500 to $2,000 um, for surgical artificial insemination. Um, and there's also an increased risk because we do have to anesthetize the female. Um, you do not necessarily have to anesthetize the female for transcervical AI. You might have to give them just a mild sedative if they're really antsy. But most of the time we're able to do it um, with uh, any, any type of sedative. So that's the only downside for artificial insemination really is because uh, there is an increased risk because of anesthesia. So end result. Um, in bulldogs, you're most likely going to have a C-section. Um, the largest litter size we've ever seen um, out of a surgical artificial insemination was in a basset hound, um, and that was 11 pups in, a, in 10 and a 